Anybody else excited about baptisms this morning? Man, I love baptisms. It's just, I just love baptisms. I get so excited. I get like a little giddy schoolgirl when it comes to baptisms, man. Uh, so we're going to do baptisms in just a little bit, but I, um, I want to kind of prime the pump before we get into it. Uh, we're um, right now going through the book of 1 Corinthians as a church. We're going verse by verse through it, exegetically through the entire book. Um, I, I hope we'll be done by September. Um, we'll see. So if you don't like 1 Corinthians, um, you're probably at the wrong church for the next couple of months because we're going we're gonna to go through it. Uh, but let me, let me kind of set something up for this. Uh, if you were with us in January which um, for a lot of you guys, you've been with us for years and years and years. Others of you, maybe you've started coming recently, or maybe even if it's your first Sunday here. Um, so glad you're here. My name is Michael. Um, just glad to have you. And uh, in January, we, we, we set our, our, our vision for the year. Like, we you know, we have a, a church mission of helping people rise above where they are to where God made them to be. That's our, that's our mission statement as a church. But as a church this year, we're really leaning into the idea of health. And when I say health, I don't mean just physical health, although we are called to be stewards of our body. I mean our physical health. I mean our emotional health. I mean our spiritual health, our mental health. All of these things that we are going to really look holistically at what it's like to be a church that's filled with healthy believers. Because you know that when you're, when you're healthy, you're able to do more for the kingdom, right? right. All right, so three people right there are believing that. I'm hoping that you guys can grasp this. If you are healthy, you can do more for the kingdom, right? And, and my goal for, for myself and also the goal for our church is that we would have the maximum impact in a fallen world. And I know that we can do that when we are healthy. So important to be able to do that. And if you were to look at this series we went through early in the year, and we're going to reference it throughout the entire year, uh, the series was titled The Temple, and that's because when Jesus came and then ascended to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit, we now as believers house the presence of God, yeah. which is, is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Like the, the fact that the presence of God is in this room is not contingent upon these walls, but it's contingent about believers like you being in this space. Yeah. Because we house the presence of God, which is unfathomable and cannot be accomplished other than for the sake that Jesus came and empowers us to be able to do that. And so in talking about how we steward the presence of God, one of the statements that came out in the series, and I would invite you to go back and, and, and use it and refresh yourself throughout the year, was that when you want to grow or you want to get healthy, it's not based on what you do occasionally, it's based on what you do consistently. That you can't go to the gym one time and do three bicep curls and expect you to get abs. Like, it don't work that way. Uh, and we all know that abs aren't made in the gym. They're made in the kitchen, but that's a whole other subject right there. But, but if you're wanting to achieve health in your life, it is done by not doing things occasionally, by doing things consistently. And how you structure yourself for that is creating value systems that you follow. And we have some church value systems that we're going to get into, and actually one of them is the, the, the crux of the message this morning. But I'll give you just some, some basic values that are found in Eric and I's family. So, um, you know, we have uh, 85 babies, and they're all over the place, and we love them. Um, and so, like, a big value for our family is family dinner. Like, that's just a value for us. I believe there's something that happens when you take your phone and you put it in a different room and you sit face to face with your spouse and your kids and you can actually have conversation and enjoy a dinner. Like, that's a big value. And I get all the barriers for it. Because like Monday, we have ballet. Tuesday, we have ballet. Wednesday, we have soccer. Thursday, we usually have people over from the church and Friday is soccer again. And Saturday, we go, oh my goodness, church is on Sunday. So I get the rhythm of chaos. But it's, it's a value for us that we are going to fight for the dinner table. And so at least four, if not five nights a week, we're at the dinner table breaking bread together because that's a value in our family. Uh, another value in our family, and I'm not saying our family is perfect because Lord have mercy, it is far from it. Like, like we have plenty of room of growth to do. But another value is like reading the Bible with our kids. Like every single night, our kids know that we're going to read the Bible. And we've had some times where we get home late and like everybody's cranky and like I'm crying, they're crying. And I'm like, just go to bed. And they're like, but daddy, what about the Bible? And I'm like, mm, I really wish you'd go to sleep, but no, this is a value. And let's go ahead and do that. Like we're going to fight for that because I know that a, a five or 10 minute moment 
extrapolated over 10 years, 20 years, is going to lead to some great spiritual rooting for these children. Uh, Another thing is like Eric and I, we pray together every night before we go to bed. Most nights. I miss a couple every once in a while, but almost every night we pray together. It doesn't matter if we're happy with each other. It doesn't matter if we're mad at each other. The fact is, is that we are going to be people that go to the Lord in prayer to unite our marriage together. These are some values. Are you seeing how these can guide the health of your life? And you can take a couple of those. I invite you to implement them. I'm not saying we're perfect by any means. Those are just some values. And here at the church, we also have values. And they guide us on how we make decisions. And if you've been through Welcome to the Rise, which is like our first step of the integration process here at the church, how you learn what the church is like and you learn how messed up I am and all that other stuff right there. Like there, there, there's six main values that we have at this church. And, and the first one, you're gonna get a crash course on it right now. Uh, the first one is Jesus is the center. Like, like at the very center of everything we do, Jesus is the center of it. We're not going to make it about a building. We're not going to make it about a person. We're not going to make it about a system. We're not going to make it about a political movement. We're not going to make it about a, a, a social issue. We make everything about Jesus. And we don't want it to be anything short of that. And so you're going to hear that time and time again, that Jesus is the center. And in fact, when I get through these other five values really quick, I'm going to talk about Jesus being the center this morning. Um, The second one is relationships matter. If you're in church or you're part of something you would call a religious system and you're not in community with other people, you are missing one of the main points of it. Yes, we're supposed to have a relationship with the Father, but we're also designed not to walk through life alone and have community with one another, and that does not exist sitting in a row on a Sunday morning. That exists being in circles that gather throughout the week and lunches that happen and all sorts of other ways you can do that. But you need to be in relationship with people because relationship is the currency that we do transactions with here at this church. It's not about just people coming in. It's about building relationships and growing together. Uh, If you're an introvert, uh, we're going to watch you become an extrovert. Like that, that's, they're all like, mm, right now. And the extroverts are like, yeah, team us. Um, and my wife left right then. No, I'm just kidding. She, uh, the baby was crying, so that's fine. Um, didn't mean to say that. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, value number three is a one team, one mission. Uh, that we believe in serving in our church, serving in our community. And it's not about the role that we have. It's about the bigger mission. So you're not going to see somebody here like Sweet Sally who has her Sweet Sally solo that she does every single Sunday. Like, that's not a thing here. Or like the, the person who's the guardian of all the coffee and they can only be the one who brews the coffee and the other person's the official donut lady. Like, like that's sweet, kind of, but it's a little possessive and it's not about those things. It's not about somebody having the exact seat they sit in every single week because that's their seat because their great-grandfather built that seat or whatever happened with it. Like, we are all about being on mission together and it's not necessarily about your particular role, myself included. It is about us together striving to be able to accomplish the mission of watching people rise above where they are to where God made them to be. The fourth one is that believers are bringers. We believe in evangelism. Like this is a core aspect of who we are. We have the greatest news ever. Like there's no news better than the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we're not going to keep it a secret. And so we actively are trying to share our faith with people. I was at Starbucks uh, this week. I was doing an interview with somebody. And during that little interview moment, we're waiting for our cup of coffee. And there's this lady, we're just making small talk about, I don't even, I think about her dog is what it was. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, how can I take this conversation and lead it to a, a moment of faith to be able to invite her? Because this is, this is what we do. We want to invite people to be in relationship with Jesus. It's baked into our DNA. Uh, The fifth one is growing is changing. Jesus loves you so much, exactly how you are, and he loves you enough that he doesn't want you to stay that way. He wants you to grow and mature in your faith. We're not going to do shallow preaching here. We're going to preach for life transformation that Jesus does. And the final one is live open-handed. We want to be generous people. In the book of Acts, they were helping each other out. They were doing whatever they needed to be able to share resources. We don't want anybody in our church family to be in need. And so we're going to join together to be able to help people out. So those, those are a couple of values that are found. And you're going to see that these values are going to go throughout the book of 1 Corinthians. I wanted to give them to you holistically in case you have missed those in the past. But today, let's talk about Jesus is the sinner. If you're ready, say ready. Yeah. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We made it through 12 verses last week. We're going to make it through five verses today. At this rate, we'll be doing a half a verse a week. 
All right, uh, starting in verse 13, it says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Context, if you missed last week, a guy named Paul started a church in a city called Corinth. He wrote a letter to them, thus the name 1 Corinthians. He's writing a letter back to them, giving them some correction on a couple things. Verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So in these five verses, Paul brings up uh, several discussion points that are important for a church to have. Remember, the Corinthian church was in a city that was thriving. It had a booming economy. It had some of the greatest parts of city life and also some of the worst parts of city life. It reminds me a lot of how our nation looks right now with some things that look really good and some things that are very unsettling. And Paul is talking to them. And last week we talked about how there were people in the Corinthian church who were clinging on to pastors and not on to Jesus. There is Pastor Paul who wrote this letter. You have Pastor Apollos, who was a great teacher that showed up. And you have uh, Pastor Peter, or Cephas would also be called in, the, in that passage. Same guy, same name. And he was another one. And these people were trying to figure out who to follow, and they were having some issue with that. And so he says this right here. He goes, is Christ divided? And he's going to ask three different questions. This is the first one. All of them are rhetorical. Like, like the answer is obviously no on this, but he, he's trying to bring up a point right now. He wants them to understand that there is some division that's going on in the church. And, and it's not just division that's going on. It's actually becoming divisive where people are now battling against each other. And, and I want to let you know that there is freedom for some division within the church. There's absolutely freedom for some division within the church because I have views that would be considered orthodox, meaning that it's found within scripture, and you may have views that you feel are orthodox. And we may disagree on some finite points, but if we agree on the main aspects of the Christian faith, there's room for some minor discussion. I'll give you an example, your view on the book of Genesis your view on the book of Revelation and how the end times are going to look, your view on the move of the Spirit. There's a couple of items like that where there are people in mainline orthodox traditional denominations and they have small disagreements on there. And that's okay. There's freedom for that. Like we'll get to the point where we can debate it out in heaven and we'll realize that Michael nailed it. You're wrong and it's all going to be great. So uh, I, and I, I'm, I'm very confident in my beliefs, just like you may be confident in your beliefs. And, and that's great. And there's room for that. We're not going to kick somebody out because they have a little different view on something. Now, if you say Jesus is a way and not the only way, we're going to go, eh, you're a heretic, stop. Like we want to make sure that we understand the correct things, but there is some room for disagreement. Now, in this idea of Christ being divided, can Christ be divided? No. no. And when it says, can Christ be divided, it's referencing the deity of God himself. It's not referencing just Jesus. It's referencing the fact that Jesus is the son, but there's also God the Father and God the Spirit. And all three of these, the, the, the Trinity of God, are all in perfect unity and cannot be divided. Which means that the will of the Father and the thoughts of the Father cannot be separate from Jesus. And the move of Jesus cannot be separated from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit cannot be separated from God the Father. Are you seeing how this works in perfect harmony together? And I'm going to show you in a second how this becomes really applicable to us. Because if you were going to look into the Gospel of John, you would find in the first chapter, these words are said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So now we know that the word, the logos, the scriptures that we evaluate, they are considered synonymous with Jesus and in existence for all of time. So when Paul wrote this letter in 1 Corinthians, it had already been established before the creation of the earth and that it's found absolutely perfect. And so now you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and the word which is Jesus, but it's also the written word of God, all in perfect harmony together. Now, if you're like, man, this is so lofty, where are you getting anything out of this? You ever heard somebody say, 
well, God told me to do this? Man, you may not hear all that much. The number of times I have heard somebody blame God for their stupid decisions is, is remarkable. And I don't mean to be like, people are dumb, but like there's some things that like, you just shouldn't do that. It's just, it's just things that aren't wise to do. And they'll, they'll blame God for it. They'll be like, man, Pastor Michael, you don't know what it's like to be married to her. I just feel like God is telling me that I need to move on and get out of this. I'm telling you, this is not a one-time thing. I've heard this many times. And I understand within a, in a marriage, there are some limits when it comes to infidelity, when it comes to abandonment, when it comes to abuse. I'm not talking about the saddest 0.1% of things. I'm talking about the majority of marriages that exist today. People go, I'm telling you, Michael, God told me that I need to get out of this marriage. And I'm like, did he? Like, as far as I know, Christ is not divided. And Jesus himself is the word. And if the word says that it's a commitment for life, like, I'm just saying that God doesn't contradict himself. I don't think he actually said that. And I'm not trying to be prideful in my thoughts about what God told you, but there are times where we misinterpret the voice of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it's actually our own emotions leading us rather than God's way. Or, or when somebody goes, you know, I, I really appreciate the local church, but it's just me and Jesus are all right. Like I got a Bible. I mean, I know it's covered in dust because I haven't read it since 2003, but I got a Bible and I got K-Love on my radio on like station, like on preset number five, like didn't make number one or number two, but it's, it's on there somewhere. And like me and Jesus are fine. I don't actually need to be in fellowship with other believers. And I'm like, no, you're, you're, you're wrong because where you think Jesus is leading you is contrary to what the word says. And the leading of the spirit is never going to contradict the word of God ever, ever, ever. And so I would be very, very cautious about when you say, God told me to do something. Now, there are times where the Spirit can lead you and you just know that the Holy Spirit is pushing you in a direction and you want to be sensitive to that and you want to operate on that and you want to do that. Perfect example, we were doing communion a couple of weeks ago. Felt the lead of the Spirit say, we need to do an altar call right now for salvation. Came out in the middle of the service in a time that we've never done it before, presented the gospel and people got saved. Great example right there of the leading of the Spirit, but that leading right there was in agreement with Scripture, not in contradiction with Scripture. Are you seeing this right here? So, so Paul asked that first thing, is Christ divided? And the answer is no. And then he asked the second question. He says, was Paul crucified for you? And the answer again is no on this, but he asked that because people were putting their faith in Paul rather than in Jesus. And we scratch our heads going, man, how did the Corinthian church get this so wrong? And can I tell you, the rise gets this wrong sometimes? There are conversations that I'll have with people and they'll accept Jesus as their savior and they'll come up to me and they'll say, Pastor Michael, thank you so much for saving me. And I'm like, oh, what? Hold on. I, I didn't do anything with that. It's all based on Jesus. And they're like, well, you know what I mean. I'm like, actually, I don't. I, I, I think you, you're getting this wrong right now because there's no work of a minister that is going to save you. It's all based on the sacrifice of Jesus and him being sufficient for your sins. I've talked with people who have said, Pastor Mike Catron, save me. I've heard it. And man, you're good, but you ain't that good. I, I, I'm just saying, like, like, nobody on this earth, not me, not Pastor Mike, not anybody in this congregation, we can't save people. Only Jesus can. It's all based on him. Now he invites us to be a part of the work of it, which is beautiful, but the miraculous salvation only happens through him. And so Paul brings that up and he goes, was I crucified for you? And the answer is no. Now, Paul died for his faith a couple of years after this. They cut his head off, but he didn't do that for them. He did that in honor of the gospel. Paul was not crucified for us. He wasn't crucified for them. It's Jesus who was crucified. He is the one who paid for our sin. And he is trying to set this straight to the church because some of them got it wrong. And while I think that's a, a, a pretty fundamental aspect of the gospel, there's still some who may even be in this room right now that, that you've, you've wrestled to understand that. And it's okay to be thankful for leaders in your life. 
It's okay to be thankful for the church. That's great things. It's great to honor all of that. But we need to realize that the church does not supersede Christ, that Christ is supreme in everything. And then he takes it to the final step. And this is where he gives us some great application. So he said, is Christ divided? The answer is, was Paul crucified for you? Baptized in the name of Paul. Man, you guys are good. You guys, you guys get it. This is easy. So the answer to that is obviously no. They were not baptized into the name of Paul. And so Paul then goes to verse 14, and this is a pretty peculiar moment he has. Because if Pastor Paul was on the scene, and he gets up and he does his, his Paul sermon, whatever that looks like. And they, they have a moment where they're, they're asking people to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and people respond to the gospel. Who would you think would be the most likely person to baptize them? You would think Paul, right? Because in our American church mindset and also in this Greek mindset that was here, they place so much emphasis on the leader in the church rather than the supremacy of Christ and the empowerment to the congregation. And so Paul shows up and he goes, I thank God that I baptized none of you. And then names like one or two that he did. And low key, what Paul's doing here is he's going, church, you got stuff to do. You guys got gifts in you. You, you guys got things that you can accomplish. Like we hold baptism up at this very, very high thing, and it absolutely is a high moment in the church. But he's saying that I don't need to be the one doing that. And in fact, I didn't even do that myself. I want to see people in the church begin to lead others to Christ and be able to baptize one another. Like that's the, that's the radical thing about Christianity is when it becomes less about the stage and more about the followers of Jesus, there's this radical explosion that takes place. Like if you look at the church in China, we have some friends that have a church in China. They cannot have public gatherings like that. You get shut down and you get kicked out or killed. That's what happens. So they have the underground church and the underground church meets in living rooms and, and it's not this super polished thing. It's just raw gospel teaching and raw radical transformation. And when that happens, it spreads like wildfire and people fill up their bathtubs. And they baptize people and it's just this awesome moment that takes place. And the reason is, is because it, it's pushed to the congregation. And that has always been at the center of Christianity, that Christ's spirit dwells in you and has empowered you to live victoriously and to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I would throw a wild goal out there for you. How many of you all have like bucket lists? Anybody? Okay, I'm just one of the weird ones who like writes down all the random things that I want to try to do. Um, I would love to camp across America. That's one of my things. I think that would be a lot of fun. So it may just be me and my dog doing that, but I would love to do that. So one of the things that I would put on your bucket list is to baptize somebody. And the reason why I say that is when you do baptisms, traditionally the one who is closest tied to the salvation moment would then baptize that person. We see a pattern of that found with uh, Philip and the eunuch. There's this guy who's in a chariot. He's rolling down the road. Another guy hops up in there, shares the gospel with him. He's like, yeah, I need to repent of my sins and trust in Jesus. He does that. And then the guy who just got saved goes, well, now I need to get baptized. Can we do it right now? They're like, yeah, let's do it right now. And they go and they find a river and they baptize him immediately. And there's that template that's laid out that if you're living your life in an outward way to where you are sharing the gospel with others and that you are unashamed of your faith and you see your friend come to Christ, which should be a, a habit for all believers, that you would then be the one who has the privilege of being able to baptize them and start the process again. And so just as a little life goal right there, and some people today are actually going to cross that life goal, which is pretty cool. Um, I think baptizing somebody is a pretty neat thing to put on your list of ministry um, goals or bucket list items. Um, let's talk baptism for one second. Um, we made it through those verses uh, fairly quick, um, but I, I want to um, lay a foundation for baptism before we do this. Baptismal regeneration. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that term. It is the term that once somebody is baptized in water, 
at that point, their faith becomes real and they are now destined for heaven. And there are some mainline denominations that practice this with babies, where they have babies and they want their babies to go to heaven. We want all the babies to go to heaven. Every single one of them love babies. And so because of that, they baptize them and they believe that the baptism would become baptismal regeneration. And because of that, they will be destined for heaven. And the issue with that is that baptism is not based on the water. It's based on the faith. So I'm going to try to explain this to you real quick. Do you have to be baptized to be, to be saved? Man, I love hearing that. And how do, we, how do we know that? Well, when the thief was up on the cross, right? You get Jesus, thief one, thief two. Thief two is like, forget you, Jesus, save yourself. And the other one says, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we know that the thief on the cross got to paradise without being water baptized. So we see an example right there in scripture of that being done. See, you don't need to be baptized to be saved, but you do need to be saved to be baptized. Because if you're not saved and you get baptized, all you're doing is swimming. In the same way, like if you take communion or the Lord's Supper and you're not a believer, all you're doing is coming to church for a snack. And like, it's not even a good snack. Like y'all had those communion wafers, like they, they nasty. Like they get stuck to the roof of your mouth. One of the most awkward things is up here when I put the wafer in my mouth and I'm trying to talk and pray and it's like stuck in this cotton mouth and do, yeah, that's uh, pastor struggles right there. Like in the same way, you can come to church and sing all the songs, but if you don't love Jesus, all you're doing is singing, you're not worshiping. You can go through the mechanics of it and the mechanics don't make you a believer. It's your faith in him that makes you a believer. And then these physical actions become a representation of that faith. So you don't need to be baptized to be saved. You need to be saved to be baptized. And when I say that, somebody's going to go, Michael, I got a verse for you. I'm like, bring it. Let's go. You want to debate Bible? Let's go. I'm ready for you. They're like, Acts chapter two. I'm like, I like the book of Acts. Let's dive into Acts for a second. And in verse 37, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. This is when, when Peter is preaching and all these people are responding to the gospel and I could just touch their heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They just became new believers. They're like, okay, now what? And these are the instructions. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They come here like, Michael, I'm just telling you, my Bible says, I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says, it's the same Bible, chill out, dude. My Bible says you have to repent and be baptized to be saved. And I'm like, well, I don't think you really understand how to fully evaluate this text. Because if you're going to dive into this text the correct way, you're going to see how it's structured that baptism isn't what creates the faith in Jesus. It's actually the other way around. Um, have any of you ever been to an award ceremony for an officer or uh, somebody in the military, anything like that, and you've watched them receive a medal of some sort? Anybody in here done that? Um, okay, I, I was at one this week. It was absolutely awesome to see some of Henrico's finest people, the uh, police department, getting awards for different things they've done, for laying their life on the line. Can we real quick just show our appreciation for the law enforcement in our community? So thankful. And here's the thing. They were decorated for their bravery. That's what happened. They received some sort of, uh, decoration is probably a wrong word, like they didn't put like a pink bow on them, but you understand what I'm saying. They got some sort of medal or something and they decorated them for their bravery. But what we need to realize is the decoration didn't cause the bravery. In fact, it was the opposite. They were decorated for the bravery. It's actually the bravery that created the honor that took place. If you talk to somebody who has committed a crime, there's a sentencing for the crime. The sentencing doesn't cause the crime. Like, you can't go, you know, I want to rob a bank. Here's my strategy. I'm going to show up to the prison and say, you need to lock me up for 15 years. And they're going to be like, get out of here, wacko. What's wrong with you? Like, go home. This is silly. But let's say for some reason you're really, really sly and you convince them to lock you up for 15 years. If you get out after 15 years, guess what you're still not? You're still not a bank robber. Like, like that doesn't cause the bank robbery. It's, it's the bank robbery that causes the sentencing. De the decoration 
for the bravery, the sentencing for the crime. It's the baptism for the sins. You see, it's the repentance from sins that validates the baptism, not the baptism that validates the repentance of sins. And so when we do water baptism here at this church, and I'll go and invite the worship team back up right now, we don't do this to get people saved. Like this water right here is not going to save anyone. Like if you were to look at this water, like it came from the tap somewhere in this rented facility and like it's greenish, like it's like, woo. Like it's not even the greatest water. It's clean enough. It's okay. You're not going to catch any diseases. But I, I look at this water. This water does not have the ability to save anybody from their sins. This tank does not have the ability to save anybody from the sins. Pastor Mike, who's going to do the majority of the baptizing, does not have the ability to save anybody from their sins. The entire thing is based on somebody coming to a point where they put their trust in Jesus. Because of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, they are now able to experience everlasting life. And this is an outward sign of what's already taken place internally. And what gets me so excited about what's happening at this church is we have so many people that have taken a step forward to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so as we're getting ready to do this right now, if you are already scheduled to get water baptized, can you just stand up where you're at and go ahead and make your way down right here? And I would love for our church to go ahead and celebrate this right now as they're getting ready to make a decision. So every single person that's coming up here right now, we've had a conversation with. We're not doing this lightly. These are people that want to go public with their faith. I've explained it this way a thousand times. I'm going to explain it to you a thousand and one times. What is this right here? What kind of ring? Wedding ring. Ezra, catch. Come on, let's go. I'm just going to brag on my son for a second and just realize that you just nailed catching that ring right there. That's pretty awesome. All right, buddy, am I still married to your mom? Yes. Absolutely. How crazy would that be if just by tossing the ring back to you that I would become unmarried? No, that ring is just a symbol so that anybody who looks at me says I belong to somebody. All right, I'm going to have you toss this back. This is where I get nervous. Yeah, yeah. all right. For real, I was kind of nervous right there. That was a good throw. That was a good throw. See, see, this is a sign of the commitment to my wife. In the same manner, this water is a sign of their commitment to Jesus. And so this is the, this is the celebration moment right now. This is where we get the chance to be able to honor the step forward that these people are taking.